Well, good morning, church. My name is Dusty White. I serve here as one of the pastors. I want to apologize in advance if I begin to cough. I was sick a few weeks ago, and I'm still battling a little bit of a, a tickle in my throat. My doc has promised me that I'm okay, okay, so don't worry about it. But I, it, is, it is annoying to listen to a guy who coughs, you know, like, that's not great. So if that happens, I apologize. I do have my water. I'm ready to rock, okay? Are you ready to rock? As you heard read, we find ourselves in James chapter 5. And if you don't have a Bible with you, there's one underneath your chair, and we'll be on page 952 if you happen to be using that scripture underneath your seat. I'm really excited for the Word of God today, specifically for our church. My family and I, we were out at the pumpkin patch uh, a couple of years ago. <clears throat> you know what I'm talking about, the pumpkin patch. The Disney of the Midwest. <laughs> and uh, we ran into an old friend out there. We were getting reacquainted with her and her kids. And she was introducing, uh, her, reminding me of her ages of her kids. She had a few kids. And, and she introduced me to her 13-year-old uh, daughter. And <clears throat> she, when she told her daughter who I was, she said, this is the pastor who prayed for you when you were having seizures as a toddler. And... From that day on, you didn't have another one. It was a remarkable moment for me that day at the pumpkin patch. Her and her husband had come forward at the church that we were at, having exhausted pediatric help. Here they were asking for prayer. And we prayed for her in the name of the Lord. And from that day on, she never had another seizure. And it was an amazing moment. That moment was amazing. The pumpkin patch moment was amazing. As a pastor, reminding myself through this girl that God heals. And that's the story that they tell. They give God all the glory for all of their healing. And there's no doubting it at all in their own life and in their own family. And in addition to that, I and we, you, some of you, have prayed for years for certain couples in this particular church to have a baby. And after 10 years sometimes, 10 years is a long time, after a decade of prayer, God opens up the womb, changes the narrative, and makes a way. Because God heals. And I've been in Nikki rooms all throughout this city over the years as a pastor where tiny little babies were fighting medical odds and parents are prepared for the worst. And we come around those little glass cocoons and we pray as the people of God. And some of those kids are back in Coromdale kids this morning because God heals. Now I know that not every story from the NICU is a story of blessing like that. Sometimes we suffer. And my family has had its own share of suffering in our home. My wife has had a fever for five and a half years. That's pre-COVID, in case you're wondering, okay? She has what medical experts call a fever of unknown origin. And after exhausting the best of the best in Omaha over the course of 2018, 2019, we spent 41 days at Mayo Clinic and let them poke and prod for a while. And we're still praying for healing. And we're still trusting God's sovereign plan. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right now. Some of you are like, hey, man, I got your next doctor. <laughs> I got a guy. I know a guy, man. You got to talk to this guy. Hey, I love all of you. You're great. Your suggestions have been great. Others of you are maybe going to email me your special Advil uh, sinus rinse, stand on your head, <laughs> essential oil concoction. <laughs> hey, I'm good. <laughs> Just trust me, we've had lots of help, okay? <laughs> Others of you can't imagine. I mean, can you imagine having a fever for over five years? And she's had good days, she's had bad days, and honestly, some fever-free days, periodically. But she's battling. I should also mention that when I came to this text, I brought it to her, and she was gracious enough to let me tell you that story. Because actually, 
She just wants to be a normal gal. She doesn't want to be the pastor's wife with a fever. She just wants to be among you and be normal. Here's my question. How do we make sense of God healing some of these stories but not all of them? The most straightforward answer to this very perplexing question is this. I don't know. I want God to heal it all. I suspect you want God to heal it all. And friends, this is why the Advent season is so important to the church. We cannot make sense of everything, and so we say, come Lord Jesus. And as we await the coming of our Lord to make all things right, we take all of these perplexing questions and we pray, thy will be done, as we did just moments ago. Friends, prayer can change us. That's what James 5 has to say to us today. Prayer can change us. Do you believe that? That's what James wants to teach us. Prayer can change us, and God wants us to be a praying church. So let's look at two ways that prayer can change us. First of all, prayer can change how we suffer. James 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. James has something very practical to say to those who are suffering. Here he gives us a few short questions and a few short answers. These are really short, pithy Questions and answers, they're quite effective. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Some of your Bibles might say he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? Sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Call the elders and let them pray. So whether cheerful, suffering, or sick, whatever the circumstance is, James wants us to be Godward-oriented in our disposition. He wants us to be prayerfully patient in adversity and thankful when we experience prosperity. All of life, friends, is lived between moments of great disappointment and great celebration. And the Christian, the Christian always has a response. We pray and we praise as the occasion demands. And James has something specific to say to the sufferer. Our troubles can manifest themselves physically, mentally, and beyond. And so the question is, posed to us today, are you sick or are you suffering? Is that you or someone close to you? James says, you should pray. And when we pray, especially in these moments, we are acknowledging God's sovereign power to meet our needs in our circumstances. And James calls out to us and says, hey, are you suffering? You must pray. And then he says, not only should you be praying, But if you're sick, you need to call on the elders of the church and let them pray. The church elders are the representative leaders of the believers in a local church. They're the men who exercise leadership and pastoral oversight over the congregation in a local context. And friends, Cormdale Church is a church that has elders who really want to be praying for you. So if this is your first time, or maybe you've just been here a couple of Sundays, maybe you're hanging out in the back. If that's you, here's the deal. You want to be known. All of us are longing to be known, and this is a church where that can happen. James is assuming that his readers know their elders so that they can call on them to pray. And our elders love praying. Our elders love praying for the sick. We love prayer in general. We spend time together praying. Just this past Wednesday, uh, across the courtyard actually, we spent a good chunk of time just praying for people by names, praying for members, praying for kids, and oftentimes tears of great joy and celebration and also great, and tears of great longing are cried in the elder room. And hey, can we just acknowledge that when people call on the elders to pray for them, they are demonstrating extreme courage. We don't live in a culture 
that wants to be dependent upon God. And praying stands out in our independent culture. Asking people to pray for you? Really? Come on. You got this. Yes, asking people to pray for you. But just a few close friends, right? No. James says, hey, tell the elders. Tell the guys who are shepherding your local church and let them pray. Man, that takes courage. Every Sunday... We end our service with a time of prayer. And if I can remember, what I like to remember to say to people who come forward up front to receive prayer is I I like to begin by just saying, wow, you just demonstrated extreme courage. Because walking from back there up here says, I believe in God. And I need God to do something in this moment. I believe in him. That's why I'm here. So actually, just walking up here is the biggest courageous faith step in the place. Prayer in these moments is acknowledging my helplessness to God. And so we pray. We ask God. (coughs) Excuse me. We ask God for his help. We ask God for his glory. We ask God for his favor. Because we know that we cannot make these things happen. In a culture enamored with efficiency, competency, this room's full of people, competent people, doctors, carpenters, lawyers, entrepreneurs. Like, we could have a meeting probably this afternoon and change some stuff in this city, in this room. I could could pull some of you together and we could develop a plan. But friends, the church is the place where all of that collides in reality and it's messy And sufferers and sinners can receive prayer, and we can pray for one another. There's no veneer. It's needy. It's humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God and asking him to do something amazing. I am so impressed with medicine. Even though my wife has had this issue, the medical world can't figure out, I still just marvel at how amazing the medical world is. And I'm super grateful for it. But you know who sees the most exceptional works of God? Doctors. Doctors and nurses do. Doctors and nurses know that they can't explain everything. Doctors know that the human body is a mystery. Doctors know that sometimes scans show something. Then Christians pray and then the scan shows something different. Doctors know that the mystery of God's exceptional healing is on his people, just like they know a lot about a bunch of different ailments and cancers and why you don't even need a gallbladder and why you don't need an appendix. I mean, they know all of this stuff, but they also know the supernatural work of God. Probably more than any of us, actually, because they see it work. James 5, 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Here it is, folks. This is your essential oil Bible verse, okay? (laughs) (coughs) And prayer is mentioned seven times in these verses. But this verse mentions anointing with oil. And in the Old Testament, oil represents the blessing and the presence of God. Kings and prophets were anointed to represent the presence of God, resting upon them in the work that he had called them to do. Oil was used for consecrating, dedicating, and purifying things to the Lord. We see this in Luke 10. In Luke 10, the Samaritan applied oil and wine to the wounded man along the Jericho Road. We see it in Mark 6. When the disciples went out on their first missionary journey and they went out anointing people with oil and healing them. So all throughout scripture, we see oil being used. I think Zach Eswan captures the earthiness of the oil for us with these words. Elders are not Jesus, but Jesus has called out to them and placed a gracious vocation upon their lives. Sometimes there are two of us. Other times there are more of us. We draw near. It signifies for the world that the sick one is cherished by God 
and that God's people not only rejoice with those who rejoice, but also weep with those who weep. Such presence is rare in the world. Linger here. Do not rush. One of the elders, a maintenance man by day, reaches his dirt-creased knuckles into his pocket for the oil. He hands it to another pastor. It smells like incense, but any oil will do, for the oil is like the dirt in the maintenance man's hands. The dirt is not the work, but a signal of the work that was done. Both the dirt and the oil offer no defense for soap. Neither can outlast the scrubbing. Both will release their grass from the skin and wash, into, wash away into the tub. But though the symbol disappears, the work it revealed remains. Like Old Testament anointing, a setting apart has taken place. This gathering, in sum, is a sign of Jesus' active presence. The oil is a sign that this person and this moment belong to him. The prayer in his name declares that only Jesus has the power to govern what ails. And then he adds this parenthetical thought. Even our good use of medicine and our active gratitude for good doctors and nurses are like shoes ultimately held together by the stitching and laces of God. So friends, when we pray and if we anoint with oil, we're not merely closing our eyes and saying words. Instead, we're literally getting on our wartime walkie-talkies and begging God in faith to hear us and change something. We're asking him to bring healing, and sometimes he does. And even when he doesn't, we embrace mystery, especially during Advent, and we say together, even so, come Lord Jesus. Would you say that with me actually again here this morning? Even so, come Lord Jesus. So whether here or there, sickness will not have the last word. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now we need to talk about this verse for a moment because it can be quickly misunderstood. This verse, this verse seems to link sickness to sin, and sometimes that is the case, but not always. We're reminded of the disciples in the Gospel of John that make a very shallow connection, and we need to be careful to not be like them in this way. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 4, this is what we read. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. So Jesus says, hey, it's not his sin or his parents. His blindness is not linked to personal sin. And then Jesus displays his power by healing him. But we also know that David in Psalm 32 feels the weight of his sin physically. In Psalm 32, here's a few verses at the beginning of Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And then in verses 3 and 4, we see kind of this physical reality. David says, for when I kept silent... My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. He's feeling something here. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. So in verses 3 and 4, we see some sort of physical reality to unconfessed sin. And then in verse 5, it turns. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said... I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So in this case, it seems like David has some sort of physical reaction to sin. He's wearing it. Like if he would have came in here this morning, you would have been like, oh, David, are you all right? Like you look a little heavy. 
You know, he's like that friend that you see and you're like, ooh, he can't be doing well. He doesn't look normal. His countenance seems off. And in verse 5, he confesses and repents. We're also reminded of the Apostle Paul. He prayed and healed all, healed all sorts of folks throughout the New Testament, but we also know that his dear friend Epaphroditus was never healed or wasn't healed, at least we have an account for it, from his lingering illness that he almost died from. We learn about this in the book of Philippians. And you can be sure that they were praying about that. So it's really ignorant of us, it's immature of us, and ridiculous of us to say to someone who is sick, what sin are you not confessing? Not super helpful. One time, uh, my family and I, we were coming back from Montana. My wife is from Montana, so we were coming back to Omaha from Montana. I th we either go there for Thanksgiving or Christmas. I can't remember which it was. I think it was Christmas. We're coming back. We had little kids at the time. This is like 12 years ago. And uh, <clears throat> we're driving back, and it's always just a little dicey. Like, you're just kind of rolling the dice if you're going to travel north for the holidays, right? And so we're coming back, and we're just in this snow, sleet, just cruddy driving, and I'm, I'm at the point where, like, I got to decide, like, are we going to do the hotel thing? Or are we going to keep going? Or what's going on? This is prior to me having some sort of cool radar app on my phone. And so I called my friend Bob, and I said, hey, Bob, can you get on the radar and just tell me, hey, like, what's this storm doing? So he called me back a couple minutes later, and he said, hey, man, you must have some sort of sin in your life. Because... <laughs> There's only this tiny little cluster of a storm that's just following you from Fargo all the way through South Dakota to Omaha. And yeah, I mean, like sometimes pastors talk like that. It's kind of ridiculous. And I probably did have sin in my life, to be fair. But so it's immature of us to talk like that, right? But it is mature and wise to realize that God gives us bodies. That's the point. And sometimes if we won't repent, God will use our bodies to get our attention. So I'd propose to you today that this isn't a verse linking sin to sickness necessarily or salvation to sickness. But rather it's James helping us remember that we are embodied souls and our bodies cannot be dismissed when we're talking about suffering and sinning. Sometimes when we're sick, we're slowed down just enough that the illness is the occasion for recalling and repenting. God is in the business of healing the whole person. So, the first thing that James wants us to learn about prayer is that prayer can change how we suffer. Secondly, prayer can change how we relate. Look at verses 16 and 17. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. James has been convincing that prayer is powerful. And now he wants us to know that not only can prayer change us, it can also change the way that we relate. To whom do we confess our sins? Verse 16 says, to one another. So certain discretion and limitation might be needed from time to time, but James is urging us to realize that when we confess our sin to one another, it opens up the church community towards genuine faith and honest prayer. Just last Sunday night, a week ago, in my living room, in my gospel community that I'm a part of, we read through a few passages of scripture, much like you probably do in your gospel community. I asked a few simple questions. And the last question I asked was something like, how do these passages of scripture move you personally towards repentance and faith? We left some awkward silence like Mike did moments ago for us. And one guy spoke up and he said, man, as we read through James 5, it says there that I need my yes to be yes and I need my no to be no. And my wife and I just had a conversation about this about how that wasn't the case for me, and he gave this example. And that, in our gospel community, is an opportunity, because of that particular confession, that's an opportunity that can change our gospel community if we take that moment in. Prayer changes 
how we relate. He's saying, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, I need prayer in this area, I'm a mess. And messy people own their stuff. Is that allowed here? Some timid souls might wonder. Yes, it is. Sinners repent into the safety of the gospel. And as we do, as we do that together, we can experience profound freedom in Christ. And it absolutely will change the way that we relate to one another. It changes us because a culture of grace starts to put oxygen into the room. People start breathing again. People are unburdened. And grace welcomes us as we confess and pray. So together we acknowledge our helplessness. Prayer can change the way that we relate. Friends, you'll notice that in this James 5 passage, there's really no individuals in this passage. It's not just you and Jesus. It's you and the elders, and it's you and one another. This is a passage that expects God to show up into our relationships. This passage expects the church to realize that everyone, everyone is an instrument of God's grace. So let me ask you, when was the last time that you unburdened your soul to someone else? When was the last time? When was the last time that you confessed your sins or were prayed for? When was the last time that you offered a genuine disposition, maybe the listening ear, maybe the caring ear, and you were actually the prayer? Or if you've wronged somebody recently, have you doubled back to confess your sin to that person and pray for each other? Now, I know that your intent wasn't to hurt and you got a lot of explanations and all of that, but we don't need all of your explanations. We need to confess and we need to pray for one another because prayer changes the way that we relate. Listen to Richard Foster in his book on prayer. We stand with people in their sin and in their sorrow. Their suffering is messy business, and we must be prepared to step smack into the middle of the mess. We are crucified, not just for others, but with others. We pray in suffering, and as we do, we are changed. Our hearts are enlarged to receive and accept all people. The language of they and them is converted into we and us. All supposed superiority whether intellectual, cultural, or spiritual, simply melts away. And together, we stand under the cross. Friends, James 5 says, prayer can change us. Prayer can change the way that we suffer, and prayer can change the way that we relate. You'll notice that I'm intentionally using the word can here this morning. Prayer can change us. Prayer is a God-given gospel opportunity that passes us by because we're pretty stuck in efficiency, in autonomy, and proving our competency. And this is a moment right here as an opportunity for us to seize and recognize together that we can pray. But what about God's sovereignty? Why did God heal my friend's daughter's seizures that week when she was a toddler, but he hasn't healed everybody else? Because God is sovereign. So why then, if God is sovereign, should we pray? Because our prayers are not a limit to God's sovereignty, but the ultimate expression of it. Friends, God wants us to pray because he wants to use our prayers to accomplish his purposes. God's sovereignty does not compromise our obedience and responsibility to pray. That's why James says here in the New Testament, you should pray. Our praying brings us right into the sovereign work of God. And God's sovereignty is liberating. His sovereignty is motivating in our prayer life. 
And when we pray, we're given the privilege of participating in God's sovereign purposes. In prayer, we're coro- we're, we, we get to cooperate with God's grand plan. So, James 5 says, Is anyone among you suffering? Anyone among you is a really wide open invitation. Some of you are suffering in silence. And today, you can pray. Others of you are sinning in darkness or stubbornness. And today, you can confess and pray. Today, James 5 presents an opportunity for us. It's the opportunity to interrupt that silence, that isolation with prayer. And this, pas- this passage expects God to show up. So for weeks, you should just know that your elders have been praying specifically towards this Sunday. They are excited to pray with you today. And we believe that the last thing you need is to need prayer and miss the opportunity. So we're actually ending the service a little bit differently today. Uh, I know that you guys are all creatures of habit, and I know you're expecting, you know, two, you know, communion, two songs, and a benediction, and things like that. I'm a creature of habit. That's what I'm expecting. But in a moment, we're going to come to the Lord's table just like we do every Sunday. But at the end of that time, we're also going to be offering a special time of prayer. Every week we end the service with an opportunity of prayer. But today, in light of James chapter 5, we're going to extend that time. So there will be no benediction here this morning. We're going to take communion. We're going to sing like we always do. And when that second song is over, our time of prayer will begin. And you're welcome to head out the doors and connect in the atrium or in the gallery with others if you'd like. But if you need prayer, I want to strongly encourage you to come forward and pray. And especially if you need physical healing and would like the elders to anoint you with oil and pray for you, we just invite you to come forward and pray. And if we happen to be praying with other people, we'll be here as long as it takes. You can be patient. You don't need to be in a hurry. Like, it, like Zach Eswan said in that lengthy quote, linger here, do not rush. Just know that pastors and other leaders from our prayer team are eager to pray with you this morning. And since prayer changes us, we're going to pray now. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, we are grateful that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, cried out to you from the garden before the cross. In his moments of suffering and need, he modeled for us what it looks like to be focused on you, his heavenly Father, and you're our heavenly Father if we're in Christ. And so we're grateful that we have a Savior who has gone before us in this way, crying out to you. And today we're grateful that you give us passages like James 5 that invite us into your work through prayer. And this morning we pray for those among us who are suffering. We ask that you would bring healing to their bodies and their ailments. And we pray that you would deepen our gospel communities in how we relate. That confessing our sin to one another would create a rich gospel culture in this church. And earlier we prayed, thy will be done. So as we take communion now and then spend some time praying together, we even ask that again, that your will would be done here. Spirit of God, help us to step into your ways with courage. I pray for my friends who are timid this morning who know that they need prayer, but they've just been suffering in silence. Would you give them courage this morning? Would you meet them in that faith? And for those of us who need prayer this morning, would you give them the courage they need to just let other people into that? And would you manifest your presence among us in your name? Amen.